Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the John Campia podcast here on this glorious weekend on this Saturday afternoon. I got up out of bed a little bit late today, so that's why I didn't get up in the morning. It's coming to you in the afternoon, but whatever. This is the show where every day I like to talk about the best things going on in the world of entertainment in television and movies and the questions that you guys sent in to me as well. And you're going to see a little bit later in the show, I'm going to be taking a lot of the topics from the questions that you guys send to me. How do you get a question or topic onto the John Campia podcast? It's simple. You simply email me anytime at the John Campia podcast at gmail.com. Once again, just email me at the John Campia podcast at gmail.com. Maybe you'll see your question or topic pop up here on the show. And I've got a couple of those picked out already, but there are a few things that have gone on the last couple of days, particularly in the worlds of movies and television that I wanted to bring up. The first thing is this talked a little bit the other day about how the movie, uh, it, had this magnificent opening Thursday night, like like the number three top opening night of the year. I think it made about 13, a little over $13 million on its opening night, night on Thursday. That is only behind Guardians of the Galaxy and Beauty and the Beast. It's made more on its opening night than any other film other than those two. Now, originally, they had forecasted that it would have a great opening weekend of $50 million. Then they adjusted that to about 60. Then they adjusted it to 75 million after that great opening night. But now apparently the movie has made over $50 million on Friday. And now the projections, according to Variety Magazine, the projections right now are that it is going to have over a $100 million opening weekend. That is a $100 million opening weekend for an R-rated horror film. Wrap your heads around that. That is phenomenal. Obviously, this is being pushed a lot by the big positive word of mouth. All the positive critical reviews are really pushing this thing to go forward more and more and more and more. And like I said on my video the other day, couldn't happen to a nicer film. I mean, seriously, it is such a good movie. It's not the best movie of the year. I'm not going to put it in my top five of the year or anything like that, but it's such a solid, entertaining movie that is a, and I've mentioned this before too, a dichotomy of a kid stand by me movie with a legit R rated horror movie kind of blended into the one. And the way they push that stuff together is just amazing. Now, will it crack a hundred million dollars on its opening weekend? It's going to come close. Right now, Variety is predicting $103 million for its opening weekend. But even if it doesn't crack $100 million, let's say it doesn't, who cares? I mean, we initially thought a $50 million opening weekend for a movie like It would have been spectacular. Then when they said $75 million, it's like, oh my God, that's insane. A $100 million opening weekend for an R-rated horror film fantastic. I mean, this is just great news for everybody. And it's great news for people who enjoy these types of movies as well, because now that's going to embolden studios to take even more risks on properties like this. Because look, a lot of people might have the uh, temptation to look in hindsight and go, oh, well, doing an It movie wasn't a risk. Yes, it was. It was kind of a cheesy two-part miniseries in the 80s. Yes, it's a popular book, but to go with a clown horror movie with one like It and stuff like that, that was a risk because a lot of people, including me, I've admitted this before, a lot of people thought this is a stupid idea. Doing an It movie now, that's kind of a dumb idea. There are a lot of people like me, I admit it, that were doing that. And they rolled the dice, they took a risk, and it looks like they are going to get rewarded big time for that. And I couldn't be happier for it. Seriously, if you haven't seen it yet, I know the theaters have been crowded, but see if you can get out to see it just as fast as you can, because it's really that good. All right, we're going to move on now to the next little topic today, and that's just something I've totally forgot about. But tomorrow night on Fox, that brand new kind of Star Trek ripoff show, The Orville... Obviously, it's a comedy. The Orville is debuting tomorrow night. I totally forgot that this was opening so soon because, you know, a lot of the shows aren't coming back until October, but The Orville has its premiere tomorrow night. It's got Adrian Pilecki. It's got, obviously, Seth uh, MacFarlane is leading it. He's the mind and the genius behind Family Guy. I believe the first episode is being directed by Jon Favreau as well. I could be I could be remembering that wrong, but I think he's directing the first one, or he's just one of the producers on. I can't remember. Jump in the comments section and remind me. Now, I am torn on this show a little bit. I, I gotta admit, I'm a little bit torn. On the one hand, 
my mind kind of rolls my eyes and goes, oh, come on. It's a blatant, not only is it a Star Trek ripoff, but it's some people say, well, it's a spoof. Well, if it's a spoof, and it is a spoof, obviously, then it's a Galaxy Quest ripoff. I mean, this is such a ripoff of Galaxy Quest. I mean, it's just, that's all I thought about. When I first saw the trailer for the first time, and I didn't know much about the project, and I saw it, I thought, oh, they're doing a Galaxy Quest TV show. And then I realized, oh, it's a Star Trek spoof that isn't Galaxy Quest. So on the one hand, I kind of rolled my eyes a bit. There is a good amount of cheese in the uh, preview trailers that we've seen for the overall so far. So that's the one side of my mind. The other side of my mind is that, you know what, I really like Seth MacFarlane. I think he's a very, very, he's a genius when it comes to entertainment. Now, he doesn't always do well when he's starring in something. Now, take Ted out of it, because Ted was just his voice, much like the Family Guy is just his voice. But for instance, when he uh, starred in A Million Ways to Die in the West, I honestly think that film would have been better. Same script, same dialogue, everything, but I think the movie would have come across better if he just hadn't starred in it himself and just directed it and wrote it and whatever else he did on the film. I think it would have worked a little bit better, because I think he is a genius when it comes to stuff like this. But... I don't know if he should be leading it. So I am questioning a little bit, although I do like him a lot. So I'm going to put that in the positive category for now because I like him that much. And while there was some cheese in the previews, yes, there was some cheese. There was also some laughs. There were some legit laughs in the previews as well. I'm a sucker for comedy. I'm a sucker for sci-fi. So on the one hand, I'm like, ah, oh, come on, bad idea, Galaxy Quest, rip off, blah, blah, blah. But on the other hand, it's like, previews look kind of funny. I really like the mind of Seth MacFarlane. This could be kind of fun, blah, blah, blah. So it debuts tomorrow night. I'm going to watch the debut tomorrow night. And right now, I think Kaori is going to watch the debut with me. And then she and I are going to do a review of the premiere. And we'll let you know what we think. I hope you guys will join us on that. But I am really curious to know what you guys think about the Orville. Does this look good to you? Does it look stupid to you? Regardless of whether it looks good or stupid, is it a show you're going to give a chance to? Are you going to check out the first couple of episodes just to see how it does? Or do you have absolutely no interest in it and you're not even going to bother checking it out until you hear some word of mouth from people? Because... Honestly, I think the marketing has been a little bit divisive. I think it's showcased the weaknesses, or at least the potential weaknesses of the show, and it showcased the potential strengths of the show all at the same time. So I guess we're just going to have to wait and see how that turns out. All right, let's move on to the next item here. And this is kind of interesting. Normally, I don't like to talk about, oh, a new poster. I don't mind talking about first posters, but when it's the fourth or fifth or sixth poster. But this new poster for Thor Ragnarok just came out. And this is not the whole picture, but this is the interesting thing to me. And maybe I'm wrong. And if I am wrong, please correct me in the uh, comment section below. But I believe this is what caught my attention about this poster. Besides the fact that it's pretty cool concept art, or not concept, right? it's a pretty cool style to go with the poster. I believe this is the first time in any of the marketing that they are showing us Odin. Now, we've all known Odin was going to be in the movie. I, I mean, that's for sure. We've known that since the post credit scene in Doctor Strange. But so far, Odin and Anthony Hopkins has been completely absent from the marketing at all. And I again, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm forgetting something. And I want you guys to point out if I am, but I believe this is the first time we're getting our first look at Odin, which is just reassuring to me. Yes, I knew he was going to be in the movie. But it's reassuring to me to see that he's there and he's not just going to be an afterthought. Hopefully, Odin and the search for Odin is what we suspect it's going to be. A lot of the movie is going to be revolving around Thor trying to find Odin and we'll see how that all unravels. Now, movie's opening soon. As a matter of fact, it opens this month. Wait a minute, John. This month is October. Well, it's opening this month in most of Europe. In a lot of European countries, it's opening on October 27th. It then opens in North America on November 3rd. So once again, Marvel employing the strategy of releasing in the overseas markets first, then have it open here. I get excited when I see them doing that because what that tells me, or at least suggests to me, it's not a rule, it's not a 100% guarantee, but what it suggests to me is that Marvel's got faith in the movie, they want to release it overseas before the North American box office so that everybody here in the North American box office can hear all the rave word of mouth and all the rave reviews coming out of Europe to get people here even more excited about it. So when it opens here on November 3rd, more and more of us will rush out to the theater. This movie's going to be a big hit. I don't think it's going to be 
an $800 million movie, but I think it's going to be a big hit regardless. I think we're probably going to be pushing $700 million that this movie's going to make, maybe $750, $770. I don't quite think it's going to make the $800 million range at this point because it's it's a Thor standalone movie. It does have Hulk in there, and that's awesome. The trailers have been incredible. More and more, though, and you heard me mention this before, what is becoming clear, especially now with the newest TV spots that have come out, with that whole thing with Thor saying, I'm putting together a team. And they say, what's the name of the team? And he goes, uh, we'll call it the Revengers. And the girl looks at him, the Revengers? Yeah, uh, never mind. We don't need a name. You know, more and more. And on top of that, what we saw in the previous trailer with Thor talking to Banner saying, we had a battle. And Banner's like, did I win? And Thor said, no, I won easily. So what we've seen more and more is that Thor has been evolving more and more into that Thor that we see in the Marvel shorts where Thor lives, I believe it's in Australia or New Zealand or something like that, and he's got a roommate. And those are just comedy sketches. But it seems like they love those comedy sketches so much, they've been making more Thor more and more like that. And I gotta tell you, high cheese potential, but it's working for me. I'm laughing a lot at this stuff. I'm watching these things on the screen. I'm laughing. I'm thinking, yeah, I'm entertained by this. This is great. So how will this movie ultimately all work out? Not 100% sure, but so far, it seems like they're really going for it. Uh, Taito Watiki is going just kind of crazy, making this kind of a spacey, weird out kind of movie. Visual style reminds me a little bit of Doctor Strange in the, uh, a bit. Obviously, they're going for some of the same aesthetic that Guardians of the Galaxy had. I cannot wait to see this movie. And everybody knows I'm a huge fan of the first Thor movie. I think the first Thor movie is next to Man of Steel. I think the first Thor movie is the most underrated and most underappreciated comic book movie of all time. I think that title goes to Man of Steel, but next to Man of Steel, I think the first Thor movie is the most underappreciated and undervalued uh, comic book movie of all time. I love that film, directed by the great Kenneth Branagh. Uh, I hope he returns to the MCU or the DCEU at some point. I'd love to see Kenneth Branagh take another swing at doing a, uh, a comic book film. All right, now with that new stuff out of the way, I want to go to your questions, the ones that you guys have sent in to me. And we're going to start off here with one of my Patreon supporters to send in a question. By the way, I'm going to take a second here and plug my Patreon. You know, if you like to have an audio-only version of this daily John Campy podcast, so you can listen to it on your car, on your way to school, or wherever, if you become a Patreon supporter, we do make the audio-only versions of the show available to my Patreon supporters. Head on over to my Patreon page. It's how... I make these shows possible. It is my Patreon supporters who actually step up and make me doing all this content. I make 70 to 100 videos a month and it's my Patreon supporters that makes it possible for me to do that. Head on over to this URL, check it out and see if becoming one of my Patreon supporters is something that's for you. And if it's not, that's totally fine. I'm just glad you're here watching the videos. All right, so let's get on to that first question from my Patreon supporter, Brandon Robinson, who writes... With the news that Disney is moving Marvel and Star Wars movies off Netflix and onto their own streaming service in 2019, don't you think they would be wise to leave their Defender shows alone due to the fact that they are very mature, dark, and more character-driven dramas? What if a very young Marvel fan goes on the Disney streaming service and clicks on the Punisher TV show? Well, thanks a lot for the question, uh, Brandon. And yeah, one of the big topics of discussion that's been going around lately is the fact that Disney has announced, in case you haven't heard, that in 2019, they are starting their own subscription streaming service, like an unto a Netflix or a Hulu. And as a result, they're going to be creating some original TV series for their service, some original movies for their service. And they're going to be moving their Marvel and Star Wars films off of other streaming service, most notably Netflix, onto their streaming service. Now, one of the big question marks up in the air is, well, what about Daredevil, Luke Cage, Jessica Jones, Iron Fist, Defenders, Punisher, things like What about all those? The only thing we know for sure is that in the initial report that came out, uh, the Disney rep said they will those shows will stay on Netflix, but here's the important two words, for now. Those are the magic two words. So yes, they said they are staying on Netflix, but for now. Ultimately, I believe this is a no-brainer. Disney will ultimately take those shows and take them off Netflix. I think at some point. They haven't announced that, but I think the writing's on the wall that at some point they will do that. So with that being said, 
What about the issue of children? You know, you're getting a Disney app. Well, here's the thing. Disney isn't starting a TV streaming service for children. They're not doing this for children. Will they have a lot of children-friendly material on their streaming service? Of that, I have no doubt. This is Disney. Of course they will have kid-friendly streaming stuff. But guess what? So does Netflix. Netflix has a lot of kids' shows. But there's also R-rated material on Netflix. Hulu has kid-friendly shows, but also a lot of R-rated material on there as well. Amazon Prime has children's stuff, but they also have R-rated stuff. There are mechanisms built in. Look, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Disney, when they start their, when they launch their streaming service, they're going to have parental controls. I, I guarantee you a Disney streaming service will have parental controls. Probably something along the lines of like any movie or TV show that has an R rating will have to have a parent passcode. So like if they want to play like some R-rated movie or whatever, or let's say they move Punisher over to their streaming service for argument's sake, just for now, let's go with that. Let's say they do move Punisher over to their series. So Punisher will be in their system as rated R. As soon as somebody hits play this on it, it'll trigger a response saying, oh, this is an R-rated thing. Put in your four digit, you know, pin, your, your parent pin, if you will, to confirm this. And then they can do that. Now, at the same time, Somebody can say, well, kids can find a way to get your pin. Yeah, well, okay, but then they can just get on the internet and type in www.pornhub.com. I, I mean, look, I, I agree. I think content creators need to be aware and they need to take into consideration um, the distinction between adult viewers and children viewers. Yes, but ultimately it's not their responsibility. It's your responsibility. Now, I'm not a parent yet, but ultimately that is your responsibility as a parent to know what your child is doing. Should people like Disney, think when they make these services, should they put in tools to help parents? Absolutely. I think that's a really good thing to do. Put in some tools to help parents. Yes, like a pen or some other thing like that that protects parents from having their children being exposed to stuff they don't want their children exposed to. Okay, that's fine. Totally understand. But to say, oh my gosh, there's going to be a streaming service that'll have children's material and more mature, we're not talking about pornography here, but and more mature thing. Well, Netflix does that already. Hulu does that already. Amazon Prime does that already. Cable does that already. The internet does that already. <laughs> I mean, there's, so really, ultimately, you got to be responsible for your kid, have the conversations with your kid. But I believe as long as Disney, and I, I would be shocked if Disney doesn't do this, as long as Disney puts in some parental controls, puts in some tools to be helpful for parents, to help protect their children, then I think it's totally fine. And I do believe that's what they have in mind. Because I also believe that I got nothing to base this on. But I'm just telling you right now, I said this on a show the other day. I believe Star Wars, as much as I've been against live action Star Wars TV shows for years now. So I don't want it, don't want it, don't want it, don't want it. But I believe one of the things Disney is planning is an adult themed, not porno, but like a, like a Star Wars Game of Thrones. I believe you, you are going to see on this new Disney streaming service, a live action Star Wars version of Game of Thrones. That's going to be more mature. It's going to have some R-rated material in it. I think it's going to be gritty. And I think that's one of the things they're playing. I think they sit back. I think Disney's sitting back and saying, wow, that Game of Thrones, man, that thing has just owned our pop culture for the past six years. Well, you know, we got this little thing called Star Wars. I bet we could do something like that. And I think they're going to try it. I really do. I really do think they're going to try something like that. Anyway, thanks a lot for the question, man. We move on to the next question now. And the next question now comes to us from Josh Atkins, who writes, Hey, John. My questions are related to the box office of Spider-Man Homecoming. Being that it's on track to make upwards of $100 million in China and currently sits at $747 million worldwide, do you think that it can surpass Guardians 2 for the highest grossing superhero movie of the year? Additionally, if it does beat Guardians, do you think that it will be able to stay ahead of Thor and Justice League. All right, thanks a lot for the question, man. And yeah, Spider-Man Homecoming has finally now opened in China, uh, which is going to be a very big market for it. As a matter of fact, it's already opened huge. Its opening day made $23 million on its opening day in China. It's on track, they're saying, to come in upwards of $60 million for its opening weekend in China. It'll clearly clear $100 million. I, I have no doubt it will clear $100 million or more in China. 
So it'll surpass Wonder Woman, but the big question is, will it surpass Guardians of the Galaxy? I'm going to say... I'm going to say there's a 40% chance. 40% chance. So I'm going to say no, it won't, but it might. Uh, if I have to say yes or no right now, I'm going to say no. I don't think it'll do like 120 in China. And then that's what it would need roughly. It would need roughly like 120 million in China to be able to surpass Guardians of the Galaxy. Because I believe Guardians of the Galaxy is sitting at like $867 million. It will definitely pass Wonder Woman because Wonder Woman right now is sitting at about $813, $814 million. So it'll pass Wonder Woman no problem, but will it pass Guardians of the Galaxy? It has a shot. It has a shot. But if I have to guess yes or no right now, I'm going to guess no. If it does... If it does surpass Guardians of the Galaxy to become the number one comic book box office movie of the year, can it hold up against Thor Ragnarok and Justice League? Against Thor Ragnarok? Well, I've already said I don't expect Thor Ragnarok to surpass 800 million. So yes, it will hold up against Thor Ragnarok. But Justice League? No. I'm predicting 900 million plus for Justice League. I don't know if Justice League will crack like the 1.1 billion dollar mark. I think it's got a decent shot at hitting a billion and joining the billion dollar club, something that no DC cinematic movie has been able to do so far, not counting the Dark Knight trilogy because that's not in the DCEU. But, you know, Man of Steel wasn't able to do it, Wonder Woman wasn't able to do it, Batman vs Superman wasn't able to do it, Suicide Squad wasn't able to do it. I think Justice League's got a pretty decent shot at doing it. But either way, I absolutely believe Justice League will, sur will surpass like $870 million, which even if Spider-Man beats Guardians of the Galaxy, that's where I expect it to come in at. And I do think Justice League will, be will beat that. So on the one hand, I think Spider-Man Homecoming has a shot of being the number one comic book movie of the year right now, but it wouldn't, even if it does, it won't hold up to the end of the year because I do believe the Justice League will uh, will beat it. It better beat it. Uh, but I do believe Justice League will ultimately beat it. All right. Thanks a lot for the question, man. We move on now to the next question. And the next question comes to us from Joel Short. And Joel Short writes, Hey, John, keep making great videos. Well, thank you so much, Joel. I will do my best. My question is, do you think that Rush Hour 4 could happen eventually? Also, what are your thoughts on the Rush Hour trilogy? Thanks a lot for the question, man. Yeah, Rush Hour is a really weird film franchise because I ain't gonna lie to you. I love Rush Hour 2. I love it, which is funny because I didn't care all that much for Rush Hour 1. Rush Hour 2 is one of those very rare films because you can probably, I mean, there's probably less than 15 where you can legitimately say this sequel was better than the original. Normally sequels go down. You expect sequels to go downhill, right? But this sequel was definitely head and shoulders above the original. I think Rush Hour 2 is amazing. It's fantastic. Then they did Rush Hour 3 and that was a bag of shit. Oh my God, that movie was so bad. Uh, which is ultimately really too bad. Now, a couple years ago, two years ago, uh, Jackie Chan was quoted as saying, and I saw a video of this. It is actually Jackie Chan who said it. He goes, yes, we're absolutely doing Rush Hour 4. Well, that was two years ago. There's interviews with Chris Tucker saying, yeah, we're doing Rush Hour 4, but that was over three years ago. So I, at this point, I'm going to say no. I don't think we're going to get a Rush Hour 4. And I'm not too torn up about that idea. I'm not too torn up about the idea of not getting a Rush Hour 4. Once again, I thought 1 and 3 were poor. I thought 3 was just terrible. 2 was amazing. I can watch 2 once every six months for the rest of my life and be entertained by it. I really like Rush Hour 2. And it's the only thing I've ever liked Chris Tucker in. I am not a Chris Tucker fan. And a lot of people say, well, John, what about uh, The Fifth Element? I think that's a great example of a really great movie and therefore everybody just thinks everybody in it was great. I didn't actually think Chris Tucker was all that good in Fifth Element. But I know a lot of you guys do and that's cool. That's why all film is subjective. But uh, big fan of Jackie Chan. But there's something about the chemistry between Chris Tucker and Jackie Chan. Didn't work so well in three, didn't work so well in one, but when it's firing on all cylinders, like it was in Rush Hour 2, it's pretty special. Those two guys together have something pretty special. Now, I've already said, I, I'm fine with them not making Rush Hour 4. If somehow a magic genie, let's, let's say my little Flash figure came to life and said, John, he whispered in my, because he's whispering, that's who you see, John, Flash, genie Flash has a very deep voice. John, F Rush Hour 4 would be just as good as Rush Hour 2. If, if Magic Genie Flash were to say that into my ear, 
First of all, I'd be going crazy. But secondly, and he could guarantee me that a rush hour four would be just as good as rush hour two, then I'd be all for it. I'll be all over rush hour four at that point. But I don't have a lot of faith that that would actually happen because rush hour three was so bad. And I think rush hour two was good enough that I won't call it a fluke. It was so good it wasn't a fluke. There is something special there. But they just seem to have a hard time mining that specialness out because they failed to do it in one and they failed to do it in three. Did it great in part two, but I think it's just a little bit too late to do a part four, to be honest. All right, now we move on to the final topic of the day. And the final topic today comes to us from Brian Clark. And Brian Clark writes, Hey, John, love your stance about the extensive reshoots and rewrites for Justice League being a good sign for the quality of the film when it's ultimately released. And I'm include and I'm inclined to agree. What surprises me then is your seeming pessimism for the state of affairs at Lucasfilm. Given recent developments, I, I'm talking I'm talking those as hugely po- I'm taking those I'm sorry as hu- as a hugely positive sign as well. I don't know about you, but I'm seeing a studio who cares so much about the brand that they're willing to do whatever it takes. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Brian. I appreciate that. And what Brian was talking about in the beginning was like. For those of you who watch me regularly, you'll know this. I believe all the stuff we're seeing about Justice League, the extensive reshoots, the the some of the rewrites going on, the fact that they're putting in so much extra money. Some people look at that as a negative thing. I think it's incredibly positive. I think that's a great sign. I think that is a signal to the fans from Warner Brothers, and it's Warner Brothers saying, we are 100% committed to making not a good Justice League movie, but the absolute best Justice League movie we can. If that means we got to shoot longer, we'll shoot longer. If that means we got to spend extra money, we'll shoot extra money. We as a company are not going to take a, that's good enough attitude. No, I think it's an amazing sign. And why some DC fans out there cry and whine when, when people bring up the topic about extensive reshoots, I lose my mind because it's like, dude, this is incredibly good news. This is amazingly positive. You should be celebrating this. I take it as an incredibly positive sign, and it's one of the reasons why I believe Justice League will be the number one DCEU box office movie of all time. I think it's going to be a great film. I think it's going to be the number one um, comic book movie. I don't know if it won't be the best comic book movie of the year because nothing's going to top Logan at this point. But I think it'll be the number one box office comic book movie of the year uh, because I see Warner Brothers exhibiting such an extreme commitment to getting the DCEU back onto the track that they always wanted it to be on. And I take that as great news. So one of the things that the question is bringing up, then, well, then why am I kind of negative about the stuff that we're seeing happening at Star Wars? The reason that that's the case is because they're two totally different situations. Like, the reshoots on Justice League are not a matter of Warner Brothers stepped in and said, Zack Snyder, you are making a shitty movie. We're firing you. And then they go out and bring in another director. No, 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 no. Zack Snyder was making his movie. Family tragedy. He had to step away. Fortunately, Joss Whedon was right there on the spot and they were to put the great Joss Whedon in there, the director of the two most successful comic book movies of all time, and put, uh, put him in there. And that's great. That is them making the best of a tragic situation. Star Wars is another issue because Star Wars is one gleaming problem. And that problem is that Kathleen Kennedy, who I am a massive fan of Kathleen Kennedy, love Kathleen Kennedy. But if I'm going to be honest and objective, the fact of the matter is Kathleen Kennedy is demonstrating that she doesn't have the ability, the relational ability to get on the same page with the director be able to properly identify, yes, this is a director I know gets it and I know is on the same page with me because a number of times now we've seen her how to dump her directors. It happened with Josh Trank and you can say there were extenuating circumstances of that. That's fair, but still it happened. Happened with Lord and Miller and you can say there were extenuating circumstances and you wouldn't be wrong. From all reports, they were basically trying to hijack the movie and weren't making the Star Wars movie that they had agreed upon But once again, it's Kathleen Kennedy not having the people skill set to be able to identify, hey, these guys weren't really on the same page as us. And now it's happened again with Colin Trevorrow. It's again, it's happened. So it's like, wait a minute, he's been your director all this time. Like he's been your, you'd announced him like a year ago. And now you're parting ways with him? I mean, better now than six weeks into shooting, yes. But I mean, what went wrong? Is it once again 
a demonstration that Kathleen Kennedy is incapable of really being able to connect with the directors and understand that the directors she's about to hire are actually on the same page with her or not. That is the most important part of the job. Because the Star Wars movies are her movies. Make no mistake. She is the head of Lucasfilm. All right? They're her movies. So the number one most important thing she can do, well, the two of them are, number one, green light, the right script. But number two is get the right director on board. And the thing that makes me worried now is that we have already seen three instances. And if you want to look back at what happened with Rogue One, you know, they weren't completely on the same page with, with uh, Edwards either on War, Rogue One, although they did end up with a great movie. You know, Kathleen Kennedy is demonstrating she does not have the skills, the right skills, to adequately really identify when a director is on the same page as her. And as a result, we've seen three sets of directors in just four movies get booted off their films. That concerns me. That is a problem. Yes, I respect that Kathleen Kennedy is removing them when she realizes, oh, this isn't working out. Then yes, I respect the moving them on, getting them out, and getting in the right directors. I respect that. That's the right move. But the problem happens before that. The problem is that she doesn't seem to have the skills to get the right directors in the first place. So this, to me, is a completely different situation than the situation that we see happening over at... Uh, uh, the DCEU, at least with Justice League. The, yes, the DCEU has also had the similar problem where directors coming and growing, writers coming and going. It's been like a revolving door over there on a lot of their projects. I mean, just look at Flash, for heaven's sakes. But with Justice League, that's a different situation. And so, yeah, I am concerned. Look, I'm not I'm not firing up, handing the panic button on Star Wars at this point, because so far every movie's been great. I've I've really enjoyed The Force Awakens. I really enjoyed Rogue One, and I, Episode Eight looks like it's going to be amazing. So I'm not worried about it, per se, but I am concerned that we are seeing a pattern here, a destructive pattern, of Kathleen Kennedy being incapable of getting it right the first time when it comes to bringing on the right directors to direct the Star Wars movies. That's concerning. And maybe they've gotten lucky that, you know, Ron Howard was there to save the day. Maybe they've gotten lucky that they still have time to bring in another director. It'll probably be Ryan Johnson will probably direct episode nine. That's what I'm betting on. She's gotten lucky. But if you keep this problem up, your luck's going to run out. And we'll see what happens with Han Solo. But this is a problem they need to address. Anyway, guys, that will do it for me for today's installment of the John Campy Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Listen, once again, check out my Patreon page. See if that's something for you. It would be amazingly helpful. You can be one of the people that ensures that content of the John Campy YouTube channel continues to get produced. Thanks so much for that. And while you're here, take a second, click on the subscribe button, become a subscriber to my YouTube channel. Follow me on social media. You see my handle right there, at John Campy. It's simple to follow me there. That'll do it for me, guys. So until next time.